Why aren't finances one thing really well? It automates yield earning. It started out as a yield bouncer called iEarn.Finance, which automatically moved stablecoins like DAI from one lending protocol to the next across Compound, Didex, Ava, and more to maximize lending yield and to ensure that you didn't have to. Then Andre, the man, innovated the idea of bringing this yield bouncing strategy into a stablecoin pool in Curve. Now anyone could deposit into the Curve Y pool and their idle stablecoins would be lent across pools to earn lending interest while accruing trading fees as an LP when trade is swapped between stablecoins in the Curve Y pool. And this is one of the earliest examples of yield farming, earning multiple forms of yield thanks to stacked incentives connecting multiple DeFi applications in what's known as money Legos. But then in the summer of 2020, Andre unveiled a new and rebranded Finance to the world. He said he would decentralize control of Finance by distributing 30,000 Wi-Fi tokens, which he said had no value, even though the market thought very differently. Wyand.Finance would continue on this mission of automating yield earning with a concept he called Vault to make it as simple as depositing tokens to earn yield using a series of sophisticated strategies engineered by Andre and future Wyand.Finance developers. The 30,000 Wi-Fi tokens will be distributed over seven or maybe 10 days of yield farming where one could stake their Curve Y pool LP token to earn more Wi-Fi. Additional pools required staking, providing liquidity in Balancer, and staking the LP token to bootstrap liquidity for this newly minted Wi-Fi token. Now, Wi-Fi, which is Wyand.Finance's governance token, was ultimately distributed only to users who provided liquidity, with no pre-mine, no pre-sale, and no allocation to the team. Wi-Fi set the standard for launching the most decentralized token, the so-called Fair Launch. Although most of the ecosystem was built by Andre Konya himself, control of Wi-Fi was transferred to a multi-sig wallet which requires six out of nine participants to agree on changes. Now the end result is one of the most epic stories in DeFi which we've covered on this channel. Wi-Fi became the fastest asset to grow to over a billion dollars in market cap in history, including stocks and other asset classes. Now, thankfully, the real value imparted by Wyand at Finance through its Y Vault suddenly enabled users to deposit tokens like DAI, USDC, ETH, and even AVA interest earning tokens like A Link. And additionally, Y Vaults were devised to enable depositing popular LP tokens like the Curve Y Pool and Curve SBTC Pool. The key takeaway in all of this is that it leveled the playing field for DeFi newcomers and DeFi pros, and that's powerful. That's what DeFi is supposed to stand for, creating a new and better finance system where anyone can participate regardless of how much or how little money they have. Wyand.Finance took the power of having a quant trading firm and automated it on Ethereum. You'll find Wyand.Finance is continually releasing new Y vaults as they're on the cusp of releasing new version 2 vaults. Take a look at Wyand.Finance forward slash vaults or zap into a Y vault with zapper.fi. C5 versus DeFi. It's the latest tribal war in crypto, and it pits the future of decentralized finance trading on decentralized exchanges or DEXs against the legacy crypto exchanges many of us use once upon a time. The differences between trading on a DEX and a KEX, like Coinbase, used to be extraordinarily different. DEXs were clunky, slow, and without liquidity, which eliminated the vast majority of the crypto trading world. But then Uniswap launched in October 2018, and things have never been the same since. Now it feels inevitable that everyone will eventually trade on DEXs and the centralized crypto exchanges, well, they seemingly have much more to lose in this race. First, let's call attention to the major differences between KEXs and DEXs. On a KEX, you give up control of your assets to trade on the exchange, but in DEXs, you never have to do that. But you do have to self-custody assets in an Ethereum wallet like Metamask. Now this might sound like a win for DEXs, but for those who don't trust themselves self-custodying, a KEX might actually be ideal. KEXs historically have had exponentially more liquidity and more trading volume, but recently in 2020, DEXs have actually begun to outperform some KEXs in trade volume, with Uniswap booking $200 million in daily trade volume regularly in the fall, and up to over $2 billion traded in a single day. DEXs can be thought of as community-owned. Anyone can provide liquidity and then earn trading fees in the pool versus in KEXs. There's a centralized team that runs the exchange and makes all the revenue. 
Kex is, offer customer support, and in many cases, excluding the bad actors and scammers, of course, they provide a service custodying funds for traders. But in DEXs, there's often no form of customer service. But there is a growing standard of having access to a team through a Discord group. Gaining access to DeFi team support has been a major advancement in 2020. Finally, KEXs require sign up with email and in most cases KYC. DEXs? Don't. Just connect your Ethereum wallet and go. You can trade frictionlessly and peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, this isn't about a battle between DEXs and KEXs anymore. It's about the expansive growth opportunity in DeFi trading. And with DEXs, that's seemingly impossible to stop. If you've tried DeFi recently, you've probably experienced the frustrations of high transaction fees as the demand for DeFi services on Ethereum have increased. And it's become normal to pay higher fees, such as $20 per transaction. I even recently saw $565 for a single transaction. Crazy. And if this blockchain scalability problem isn't resolved, these transaction fees will act as a major roadblock to the mission of banking the unbanked with permissionless finance. And in that case, DeFi really becomes more of a playground for the rich. Thankfully, this is why countless research teams have been working for years on upgrades to Layer 1 with Ethereum, as well as a series of Layer 2 solutions, which act as an overlaying network that lies on top of the underlying blockchain, doing a lot of the work for it. So let's consider Ethereum first. It's the underlying main blockchain architecture, Layer 1. And interestingly, if you're watching this series in 2021, Ethereum only recently launched phase zero of its long-awaited transition to Ethereum 2.0 and proof of stake, which will mean Ethereum no longer uses a proof of work consensus like Bitcoin, no more miners, that means faster transactions, less electricity burned, and reduces the carbon footprint of the Ethereum network. It reduces centralization risks and a layer one design that aims to be, oh yeah, World War III resistant. Yes! the nerds are building to ensure their technical achievement outlasts them in an end-of-day scenario with World War III in mind. Yes, only in crypto. If the rest of the world is gone, you'll still be able to buy ETH. So what's Layer 2 then? Well, Layer 2 is a collective term for solutions designed to help scale your application by handling transactions off the main Ethereum chain, Layer 1. Now, transaction speed suffers when the network is busy, which can make the user experience poor for certain types of dApps, especially in DeFi and those related to gaming with NFTs. And as the Ethereum network gets busier, gas prices increase as transaction senders aim to outbid each other. And this can make using Ethereum very expensive. So to summarize, we need Layer 2 because some use cases, like blockchain games, just make no sense with current transaction times, and it can be unnecessarily expensive to use blockchain applications. And any updates to scalability should not be at the expense of decentralization of security. So Layer 2 builds on top of Ethereum. It's doing a ton of the work so that Ethereum doesn't have to do it, and then the transactions are written back to the Ethereum blockchain. Now the key takeaway is that 2020 was about DeFi stretching layer one to its giddy limits, which led many in the community to finally understand firsthand just how badly we need scaling solutions. And it's funny how often the answer is right there in front of us, but we just don't go there because it's not that big enough of a problem. But the good news is that many teams with much greater foresight than the most of us have been working on this for years. And it feels like DeFi is the final kick in the butt that we needed to get building Web3 applications on layer two. Stablecoins on Ethereum boast an estimated $20 billion in liquidity, and they show no signs of slowing down in growth. If you've used DAI, SUSD, USDC, or USDT, otherwise known as Tether, you know how important and useful stablecoins are. They come in all varieties, flavors, and smells. Decentralized versus centralized, backed one-to-one -one by dollars versus over-collateralized versus reportedly under-collateralized. No idea who we're talking about there. However, there's been fierce competition to create the purest, most decentralized, most reliable dollar-pegged stablecoin in DeFi. Some argue it's MakerDAO's DAI versus other who prefer the newer SUSD created by staking SNX on synthetics. In DeFi, it's always about, what's next? What's next, Alp? He doesn't know, nobody knows. And in the case of stablecoins, what next? Well, it appears to be Algorithmic stablecoins. Well, what the heck is an algorithmic stablecoin? I'm gonna tell you. 
Algorithmic stablecoins tend to attract two types of people. Those interested in bootstrapping a censorship resistant stablecoin, you know, the DeFi dreamers, and those financially incentivized by the reward of holding a token that rewards you with compounding daily returns whenever it's above the dollar peg. Now it's worth noting algorithmic stablecoins like ESD or DSD have boasted returns of two to 3% interest compounding every two to eight hours, meaning as high as 3000% APY. That is a lot. Algorithmic stablecoin protocols like MTSET ESD are designed to bring the native token back to $1 while market cap grows due to demand from those participating. So your burning question should be, how does an algorithmic stablecoin remain yeah, stable. Well, in the case of empty set dollar, it establishes a voluntary supply expansion and contraction that helps bring an ESD back to its dollar peg. This means if you hold ESD, you can do one of three things, depending on the price of ESD and one's risk tolerance. So you can hold and do nothing, or hold bonded ESD and earn more ESD, or you can burn ESD for coupons. If participants early on earn more rewards, then we have a larger market cap from newly minted stablecoins, and more liquidity means more participants can take part. And more participants means more network effects, growing attention around the stablecoin, and hence more demand for the stablecoin, and more minting of stablecoins to bring the stablecoin back to peg, and so on and so forth. If your head's spinning, mine isn't, but it sort of is, it should. There's a tremendous amount of game theory Andre like Ponzonomics and high risk money games at stake with algorithmic stablecoins. And that being said, they are here and they are growing in popularity. If just one could succeed as a censorship resistant stablecoin, try saying that fast. Many believe all this experimentation will be worth it. Now the key takeaway here is that algorithmic stablecoins demonstrate more of the bleeding edge financial experimentation in DeFi. A good thing or a bad thing, I don't know, but experimentation generally is a good thing. And whether it's innovation or short-sighted gambling, we don't know yet. In light of recent regulatory scares in the US about stablecoin regulation, the idea of a censorship-resistant stablecoin, I still can't say it, has huge demand in DeFi, but it's impossible not to ignore the epic incentives these early adopters enjoy to help maintain the dollar peg of newly minted stablecoins with market caps anywhere from a few million to near $500 million in the case of MTSEP. And just imagine being rewarded by the Federal Reserve for keeping the dollar worth a dollar. That would be wild, but that's effectively what this is. You've been watching DeFi 101, do be sure and check out the other videos in this series and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the new videos as they drop. And above all, stay safe out there.